people uh, keep logging in to our seminar. Um, and then we will get rolling in a couple minutes. Thanks for joining us. All right, well, uh, thank you everybody for joining us for the next installment of our Ecology, Evolution, and Conservation Biology seminar series. Uh, this week, I'm really excited to be introducing Dr. Susan Jarvie uh, from the uh, Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences at University of Hawaii Hilo. Um, Dr. Jarvie began her career in education and then uh, made a switch with a deep interest in veterinary medicine, ended up getting a PhD at uh, Northern Illinois yeah. University, uh, did postdocs at the City of Hope National Medical Center in California, as well as the Smithsonian Institute. Um, she's worked on what you could consider some charismatic megafauna of wildlife diseases uh, with things like avian malaria in Hawaii, which uh, many of us have probably heard of, um, a pretty big issue, but she's also worked on some uh, lesser known diseases, which she is going to be discussing with us today. Um, and I just wanted to take a quick moment to thank some of the partners in sponsoring this series, uh, Department of Fisheries and Wildlife, Forest Ecosystems and Society, Botany Plant Pathology, and Integrative Biology here at Oregon State University. And with that, I will turn it over to Sue. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Ryan. And hi, everybody. Um, again, I'm Sue Jarvie, and I'm going to talk today about a disease that many of you maybe not, have never heard of, rat lungworm disease. Um, and it's a, a tropical disease uh, that uh, affects um, uh, your central nervous system and, and brain. And I have worked with a lot of collaborators over the years, and these are some of the uh, folks that are uh, in my lab. Uh, at this point in time. So these larvae are tiny, 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 microscopic. This is the infective stage, and I'll come back to that in just a few minutes. So rat lungworm disease is caused by uh, Angiostrongylus cantonensis, which is a nematode, and it's a global disease. It's been reported in over, in over 30 countries uh, uh, to date, um, and it's been in Hawaii, uh, uh, known to be in, have been in Hawaii uh, since the 1950s. Um, so it's, it's some of the earliest, uh, the earliest uh, documentation of this parasite came from Canton, China in uh, 1935. And so that's why it's called Angiostrongylus uh, canton, cantonensis. Uh, human disease, uh, human cases, uh, I think the first human case ever reported was in 1945 in, in Taiwan. And in Hawaii, uh, we had cases, uh, our earliest cases uh, have been in, uh, from Oahu, uh, I think one, uh, 1959 and 1961. Um, so the, we know the parasite has been in Hawaii for uh, many decades and has been affecting humans for many decades. So now, while we had cases um, uh, 10 years ago on Oahu, um, mostly, now it's switched to Hawaii Island. Okay, so most of the cases now originate from here, East Hawaii Island, and Hilo's right in here. Um, uh, so one of the questions that we've been asking is, why is it all of these cases are originating on East, in the East Hawaii Island? So here's the, uh, caseload uh, south south uh, Hawaii um, north Hawaii uh, so most of the cases this is Maui 
Uh, we have had cases on Maui, we've had cases on Kauai, uh, and of course we've had cases on, on Oahu as well. So the life cycle involves the rat, that's rat lungworm disease, um, and it also involves intermediate hosts, slugs and snails, and any slug and snail uh, can be carriers of this. Um, so the life cycle is a rat gets infected by eating an infected slug, and it's the third stage larva. Um, so in the, in the slug, um, uh, when the slug gets infected, it gets infected with the first stage larva from rat feces. They love to eat rat feces. Um, and so it grows uh, in, the, in the slug or snail. Uh, it goes from the first stage to the second stage to the third stage. And it's that third stage that's uh, infective back to rats and to humans, dogs, horses, all sorts of different uh, animals can get infected with the L3 stage and uh, develop sometimes many uh, very severe symptoms. Okay, so the rat um, uh, will ingest the slug uh, or, the, uh, or the snail. Um, and uh, it takes about, uh, to go a complete life cycle takes about six to eight weeks. Okay, so it develops into the fourth and fifth stage in the rat. And then uh, the adult worms, uh, when, it, it, and when it's the fifth stage or subadult, it travels to the pulmonary artery of the rat. And that's where it develops to adults. And the adults uh, mate, reproduce, produce eggs. Those eggs uh, will turn into L1s. And then they migrate up the bronchial tree and are actually swallowed by the rat. And then, um, uh, then those uh, L1s are excreted in the, in the feces and those slugs and snails eat, this, eat the, the feces and get infected. So that's ba basically the, uh, the life cycle. Um, and then when others uh, get exposed to L3s, uh, peritonic hosts, for example, crabs, prawns, shrimps, frogs uh, can become infected. Um, Accidental hosts like ourselves, okay, uh, can become infected um, uh, with the L3, L3 larva. And these are, this is the eggs uh, that you can see here. So the life cycle begins when the eggs are laid uh, and, um, and develop into first stage larva, then they make it to the lungs and go up the bronchia and are swallowed. Okay, this is the first uh, pictures of the first stage larva that exit in the, in the feces. Um, slugs and snails will come eat that uh, feces and become infected. This is the slug, this is called Parmarion martensi. This is a semi-slug. And while I mentioned that all slugs or snails can become infected, uh, uh, serve as intermediate hosts for this parasite, uh, it was when this slug was introduced to East Hawaii, probably back around 2001, 2002, but we knew uh, in East Hawaii by 2004 that we had these semi-slugs were everywhere and they were very heavily infected. So that's one of the reasons we think uh, we saw started seeing an increase in the number of cases at that point in, in time. So these are the different stages. They develop into the infective third stage uh, larva, um, which is the one we are really concerned about. And um, uh, they eat, uh, again, the rats eat the third stage larva and become infected. Uh, these, uh, uh, these parasites can survive the um, acidity of the stomach. So they, they can thrive quite well in, in stomach acid. Um, once they get in the bloodstream, they travel to the brain and the central nervous system. Uh, you can see the worm over here. This is a rat, a brain from a, a rat uh, that we had used in one of our, our studies. And then when it's in the brain, it grows to the fourth and the fifth stage. And then it makes its way out of the uh, brain and into the pulmonary artery of the heart and lungs. Okay, so you can see the worms uh, in this pulmonary artery of this, of this rat. And um, if you're squeamish, you can look away. <laughs> so when you pop open that pulmonary artery, um, uh, these are the females. Um, you can see with a kind of a barber pole stripe characteristic. And then these are the males uh, here. 
Okay, so um, we used we used to have a lot of native snails, uh, snail, snail species, over 750 species here in Hawaii. Now that number has dropped to about 10% uh, remaining. And most of these are found in high, high elevations. Um, and Rob Cowie's lab has tested uh, these native snails and seven species are test, have been tested and two of these were positive. Um, so it doesn't mean, uh, and then most of the slugs and uh, slugs we have here have been introduced. And so uh, uh, at the over 80, uh, 80 species have been introduced and now we have uh, establishment of 33 species. 12 of those are freshwater, 21 of those are terrestrial. And again, this Parmarian martensi was originally introduced in, on Oahu back in the mid 1990s and documented on Hawaii Island in East Hawaii in 2004, and then just on Maui in 2017. And this is when uh, we, they had an outbreak on, in East Maui uh, of uh, six human cases. And that's when we, they doc documented that that the uh, semi-slug Pomeran martensi was actually on, on Maui. It's not yet on Kauai. Uh, I would hope to be able to keep it off of Kauai. But again, any slug or snail can serve as an intermediate host uh, for this parasite. And of course, uh, those species of slugs and snails that are ground dwelling have higher rat longhorn, or have greater rat longhorn than those that are um, uh, arboreal and, and freshwater. So East Hawaii has one of the highest uh, Angiostrongylus cantonensis infection rates in rats. Uh, we ran a study uh, a couple of years ago and 94% of the rats in the week uh, tested uh, something along the lines of 545. Um, and, and over 70% of the semi-slugs uh, were positive. Um, so these are very, very high infection rates in both rats and in semi-slugs, okay? Uh, and, and we've tested other species of slugs, uh, working with Kat, uh, Catherine Fiedler on Kauai, um, only less than 18% of the 170-something slugs and snails we tested were, were positive. So there's a big difference in uh, the infection level in the slugs on Kauai versus here in, uh, on Hawaii Island. And again, we had an outbreak on Maui and it appears to correlate with the introduction of uh, semi-slug uh, to Maui. They have a different behavior, these semi-slugs. You usually think of slugs as being slow, uh, but these are very mobile. Uh, they climb, they climb into people's coffee cups. They climb everywhere and um, they like to be in, they do really well in residential uh, areas. So they're a big, a big concern. So is rat lungworm in, in wildlife? Yeah, unfortunately, uh, we're working with uh, Chris Niebauer, at, 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 who used to be with USDA APHIS here in Hilo. He's now uh, in, uh, back in New Zealand. Uh, but we looked at um, different types of frogs. We have koki frogs here that were introduced uh, not too long ago. They have a very loud <laughs> voice. Um, so we looked at koki frogs and 84% of the uh, the 44 individuals that we tested uh, were positive. Um, these koki frogs are not very big. And <laughs> we found a, an entire semi-slug in the stomach of one of these. Uh, so that the, the koki frog, it must have been half the size of the frog. Um, and it, it just ate the whole slug. Um, uh, greenhouse frogs, cane toads, uh, um, anoles, a lizard, okay, 50% of those we tested. 20% uh, of the geckos uh, we tested came up positive. 83% um, of, of centipedes uh, came up positive. Um, mongoose was introduced pest here, 70% of those came up. And, and common minor birds, 55% uh, of those were coming up. We haven't tested a lot of other uh, birds, uh, bird species. Um, uh, California, you know, chickens and ducks and uh, geese don't seem to get it. Uh, they can eat slugs, uh, you know, they're out eating, eating slugs all the time and, and we haven't had any cases or reports that they become uh, sick. I know in Australia, the tawny frogmouth um, does 
develop symptoms. So why in some bird species and not others, uh, we, don't, we don't know. Um, so yeah, it's, it's uh, uh, the reservoirs, it, it could be in uh, reservoirs of infective rat lungworm larva. The studies we haven't done yet are to see if, um, if, if you take these slugs, uh, these uh, uh, frogs or, or other um, uh, paratenic hosts, um, if you feed them back to rats, do rats get infected? We haven't done that study yet. So how do humans become infected? Well, um, any number of ways you have to ingest the third stage larva, either in food, and, and yes, this is a semi, half of a semi slug and a spring roll that this poor person had, this person had purchased at a local farmer's market and bit into it uh, and ate half a semi slug. Okay, so it's, it, and it's frightening. You know, we deal with people that eat their salad and then at the bottom of the dish or sometimes not even at the bottom. Uh, there's a, a, a slug, and it can be any slug or snail, okay? But the semi-slugs are the most common ones we find in, in, um, in, in foods. Uh, also, we had an outbreak uh, in, uh, with liquids, okay? So um, uh, they drink in kava, which is a local, uh, local drink, and, and they found a slug. They shared, uh, a, shared a, a bowl of, of kava. And uh, many of the people that drank it um, became ill. So uh, we also tell people uh, uh, water. Okay, so a lot of people here, including myself, are on catchment. This is where you take the uh, water collected from the, your roof and the, and the drainage, and it goes into a, a big tank. Um, this is an issue because slugs uh, will crawl in, especially when it's um, uh, dry because they're looking for water. And so they go in and they get into the tank and they drown and they can't come out. But we've been able to show that drowning slug, when a slug drowns, the larva leave the, um, leave the slug and that can, uh, they can remain viable in water for, for many weeks. Okay, so we always tell people, make sure your water is properly treated, okay? Um, uh, even, even garden hoses, you know, you can find slugs uh, crawl into garden hoses. And there was a couple in Kauai that thought this was how they were infected because they both drank from a garden hose. So those are some of the routes of, of, of transmission. Most people, it's e eating uh, eat or even a part of a slug, uh, or uh, we don't have the documentation, but slugs and snails produce a lot of slime. They actually produce different types of slime for different uh, needs. And so can someone get infected from the slime? Is there a high enough parasite load uh, in there? We can certainly detect it uh, in slime by PCR, but it looks like the, uh, the number of parasites that are in the slime itself is a lot lower than uh, maybe tenfold or more lower than what you can find in the body of the slug itself. So whether there's enough larva uh, in the slime it's certainly viable, uh, you know, and it's it potentially, it's another mode of transmission. So what happens when humans get infected? Um, the larva enter, either uh, enter you know, upon ingestion and they, um, and then the larva travel to the intestines, they travel through the stomach, they can cross over uh, the, in, in the intestines across the mucosal, uh, the mucosal membrane. Uh, get into the bloodstream and eventually make it to the central nervous system, just like it does in the rat, okay? But in the rat, after it matures to L4 and L5, uh, then it, in, in L5 are also known as subadults, it moves to the pulmonary artery, and that's where it develops into reproducing adults. In humans, uh, its the central dogma has always been, well, it dies in the brain, and so it, it can uh, become L4, and L5, but then it dies in the brain. And that's what's been thought for decades. But um, they found in, uh, upon autopsy in, in people, uh, especially children, they have found adult worms that have developed to adults and uh, went to the pulmonary artery in humans. And so this is uh, an area that 
uh, really needs to be uh, to be watched. You know, um, uh, can it can it reproduce? And to date, there have been no studies to look to see if we find L1s in human feces. It just hasn't been done yet. And so that's something um, uh, that really we really need to uh, to to watch. So uh, travels through the blood to the central nervous system and uh, the brain. And so it's an immunopathology because uh, as a worms uh, uh, in the brain, <clears throat> because they, they uh, uh, as they migrate around, they can cause damage. And then one of the responses is uh, eosinophils. So eosinophils are one of your white blood cells that kills uh, larger parasites. And so you have increased eosinophilia. Uh, we have eosinophils can secrete some types of enzymes that can damage the tissue. Okay, so that's also a factor here. So not all the damage is done by the worms themselves. It's an immunopathology event where your uh, eosinophils start secreting uh, enzymes, toxins that are actually damaging to, to the uh, brain tissue. Some of the symptoms, uh, these are symptoms from a um, uh, paper uh, I wrote uh, a little while ago. And these are from people that had confirmed diagnosis of angiostrongyliasis. That's another term for um, rat lungworm disease is angiostrongyliasis. Um, so these are some of the, the uh, symptoms they had reported. Uh, common headache, uh, stiff neck, fatigue, mental clarity, skin sensitivity is a, is a big one for, for many people where even years after being infected and the worms have died um, or, or your, your immune system has taken care of them, um, some people have sensitivity so, uh, so severe that they can't wear you know, sleeves on their arms because it hurts. It just, it just really hurts. Um, and these symptoms, sometimes they go away and sometimes they don't. There's a wide variety of, of, of um, uh, symptoms that, that uh, don't resolve. Okay, so it can be uh, a day to a couple of months. Most, most symptoms occur in about two weeks. And you have to remember too that many people don't know how they got infected. You know, they think, well, maybe, you know, I had lettuce in a salad in a sandwich that I got from such and such, but many times uh, people do not know how they got infected. So enteritis, eosinophilic enteritis is, is uh, one of the major disease uh, caught symptoms. Eosinophilic meningitis, uh, in inflammation of the meninges. And then if it's, um, uh, uh, a real severe case, you can have encephalitic angiostrongyliasis, uh, which can uh, result in, in coma and death. So it's inflammation, okay? So one of the, um, and I'm not a phys clinical person, uh, but one of the uh, main drugs I use is a steroid to control this, this inflammation. So some of the questions you're asking, how to wash your veggies? We get asked this all the time. How can you best wash your veggies? Uh, is there a, a, an available vegetable wash that will actually kill the larva? That's one of the questions we're working on. And then how else can you kill these guys? UV light irradiation, is it effective in killing the larva? Okay, how effective are antiparasitic drugs on the infective stage larva and on adult worms? And so this has been an issue uh, over the years because if you have a, an infection and you have the larva in your in the brain and central nervous system, and you use antiparasitic drugs, you're going to have a large die-off of the larva, and that can also trigger uh, additional inflammation. And so that's why clinicians always say, you know, use a steroid cover. Um, uh, and so, um, so how effective are these drugs? And so we'll talk a little bit about that. And so also less invasive diagnostic. And so right now in Hawaii, um, the way you're tested is a PCR test of the cerebral spinal fluid. Okay, so that is in itself a bit invasive, but that's that's the, definitive test right now. So we're working on a number of different 
approaches, both antibody-based approaches and uh, tests that we could run with blood samples so that people don't have to be hospitalized. In order to have a spinal tap, you need to be in the hospital, right? So um, that was, that's another area uh, we're working on. So before we get started on all these studies that we're, we've been doing over the number of, a number of years, uh, we needed to find an assay that would definitively tell us if the larvae are dead. Because you can look at these larvae um, under the microscope and if they're moving, you know they're alive, but if they're not moving, are they really dead? Um, and so that's what we needed to do first. And so we de developed this death assay and all of our animal studies are, uh, we're working with USGA APHIS here in Hilo. They have a, a nice animal facility. We don't have an animal facility here at UH uh, Hilo. So we began this trial a couple of years ago uh, with uh, uh, Norwegian rats, okay, where we looked at, uh, uh, we're able to kill larva. We know for sure they're dead if you put them in a minus 80 for a while, and that will kill them. So that's how we killed our, our, our larva. And then, so we had a, a, 10 rats that we gavaged with dead stained, perfidiamide stained larva. And then we had our other groups, dead, unstained, live stained, live unstained and, and uninfected rats. And we could indeed tell that, that uh, these are the dead ones. Okay. And they have, um, so, so the propidium iodide uh, under the fluorescein fil uh, filters uh, will uh, uh, almost glow. Okay. So you could tell very clearly what is a dead larva and what is a live larva. Uh, the live larva fluoresce, uh, fluoresce green. And so now we had an assay. And so we could say those larvae are dead or not, okay? And Dr. John Jacob, who, who is a, a PhD student right now, it was, had played a big role in, in getting this uh, assay off the ground. Okay, so we can do some studies. What, what, what's the best way to wash your veggies? Um, what, are there commercially available vegetable washes that would kill the larva? And then what other treatments might be effective in killing the larva? Okay, so back in 2012, we didn't have the propidium iodide assay uh, worked out. And so we just looked at different uh, solutions um, and just looked at percent immobility. We know that bleach um, is very effective in killing and, and at least causing them to be immobile. This uh, dodecylbenzene sulfonic acid is also, was also shown to be causing them 100% to be immobile. Again, we can't say that they're really dead. And then 10% salt water seemed to have a role as well. So then after we developed the assay, uh, Argon uh, looked at a number of different um, uh, substances, I think over 40 or, or 50, and the, these are, are just some of them. But what you can see, even by day seven after treatment, um, uh, you don't have high levels of mortality. Uh, and he's, again, counting uh, the number stained uh, versus the number not stained. So all of these vegetable washes don't seem to be very effective, okay, uh, based on uh, uh, even going out to day, after day seven, okay. And so with this one, this is product showing greater than 50% uh, kill, kill rate. Uh, and so even on uh, bleach, very, very effective, okay? Um, also household salt. So right away, 10% household salt uh, it was shown to be very effective. And so this is why we recommend uh, for people to, um, to make, if they, if they have slugs in their lawn, don't touch them by hand, of course, uh, wear gloves, but put them in a slug jug. And a slug jug is basically a 15% salt solution uh, with a wide uh, jug uh, opening so that you can fit uh, the slugs and snails in there. And then the slug or snail will drown and the larva will die in that 15% salt water. It's important to leave it in there at least for 24 hours. It's better than stepping on a slug or a snail out on, uh, in your yard because what will happen then is that the slug or the snail uh, the, will die, um, but at the same time, the larva don't. And then they can go out, those larva will escape that dying host and go out and infect other um, uh, peritonic hosts or, or other um, 
other slugs or snails. And so there are a number of very effective bleaches. One of them is DBSA, uh, benzene sulfonic acid is a surfactant that appears to be uh, very effective. Um, Argon just wrote up a paper. If anybody wants a draft, let me know. Um, uh, just, just to uh, mention this, um, we uh, hosted the uh, sixth international rat lungworm conference here in Hilo, Hawaii this past January. And parasitology, uh, the international parasitology uh, journal has offered to publish all those papers. And so I'm the uh, special editor on that. And so Harvon's paper and, and all of our, a lot of our papers are going to be published in that, which we hope to get out um, by, should be published by January or February in 21. So anyway, this all this paper uh, will be coming out with that group. Argon's also, also tested alkaline pH because we know uh, with sodium hydroxide, because we know um, the parasite can live in acid. It lives in our stomach acid. Okay, so he looked at different alkaline pHs and found that 13 seems to be very effective uh, right away. Okay, so this is after 24 hours. He also looked at the effects of drying on, on hard surfaces on these uh, IL-3 larvae, okay, and he found um, that uh, these are the runs, okay, so these are the averages of, of the runs, and we see a significant drying uh, on day three, and certainly almost all of them uh, had died, uh, four minutes of, of drying, so moisture seems to be really important uh, for the larva to, to live. Uh, then he looked at what happens when you take, treat them with alcohol and then dry them. And you even had uh, earlier, uh, earlier results, 100% by day three and here 80%, well, average 71% um, uh, from uh, two minutes of, of, of drying. So, so desiccation seems to be, uh, affect them, uh, affect the larva uh, uh, pretty clearly. Um, refrigeration versus freezing. Okay, Argon looked at uh, refrigeration and, and then put them in a regular freezer from Sears. Okay, and then he, of course he found um, uh, increased uh, mortality uh, the longer it stayed in. So for the refrigerator, it took uh, five, well, even going out to day seven before almost all of them were, uh, had died. Uh, and in the freezer, it's, just, it's much quicker. And so here at day two, even in under freezing conditions, we have significant deaths. And you might look down here and say, oh, well, there's only 6% down here. Uh, but what I th we think is happening is that the DNA is probably starting to degrade uh, in, in the freezer and the propidium iodide has to intercalate into the DNA. So if the DNA is not, is not um, uh, intact, uh, the propidium iodide stain, which we're using to say whether it's dead or not, uh, can't, can't bind. So at least we know that day two, uh, with two days of freezing, we have pretty significant um, uh, death. Ozone and ultrasound, argon just started. You know, they've used ozone for killing uh, bacteria and viruses for and lots of different reasons. And ultrasound is used in, in China as well for as a vegetable uh, a cleaner. I just want to check my time. Okay. Um, so he he's uh, he's only done one run of, of these. Okay. So uh, with with um, uh, ozone, uh, he did see a substantial death after uh, seven days under different conditions. Ozone treatments and ultrasound. He's still he's still working on on this one. Uh, so the, these are other uh, tests we're running right now. So how effective is UV light and ir irradiation in killing the larva? And for this, we're working with Dr. Peter Follett, who is an expert in um, uh, irradiation of, of anything going out of, of Hawaii exported, uh, it goes through Peter. And so his technician, Lindsay, um, has been uh, working, working on that. The reason we uh, um, started this study was that, you know, Peter's with USDA, and in California, Hawaii exports a lot of produce and products to uh, California. And they started seeing uh, uh, semi-slugs showing up on their 
on the exports coming out of Hawaii. So California USDA contacted Peter Follett here uh, and, and we initiated the study to see if uh, standard doses of radiation that's being used currently in exports, uh, it, would that have any effect on, um, on these larvae? So we did run some experiments and again, fo focusing around this 400 gray, it's kind of the generic dose. Oops, sorry, hold on, I'll keep going on the wrong screen. 400 gray is on the generic, um, uh, kind of the ge generic dose for control of, of insects for a produce export. Um, and so he, we tried all of these six irradiation doses, even up to a thousand gray, which is pretty substantial. And we saw no significant mortality. Again, this is using the propidium iodide um, uh, stain, okay? And 30 days after irradiation treatments, only a quarter of the uh, larvae were still active. And so the thing is, um, in, based on the literature, does your radiation uh, inhibit uh, development of the parasite in vivo. And so that's the next testing that we're heading for is as soon as COVID is over, USDA APHIS can, can open up again. Um, we want to run this trial to see if irradiation itself uh, will inhibit uh, the development of the larva in the rat. So that's, that's in the queue. And, uh, and Lindsay has become an expert and rearing <laughs> these slugs and snails in, in the lab. Uh, so she's getting a little paper out on that uh, as well. It's going to be in this issue of parasitology. UV radiation, this is Yako. Uh, she just recently graduated. She's applying for medical school next year. And she looked at lots of different doses of UVC radiation. Okay, so the question is, what is the mortality rate uh, uh, in acanthansis L3 following UV radiation? She does see a nice dose, uh, uh, dose response. Okay, the higher the uh, millijoules, the, the more effective it is, but we don't see uh, right away. It usually takes a while. Uh, and here's the uh, typical dose uh, for uh, based on the National Science Foundation certification for catchment systems uh, is right here. And so we do see a dose response, uh, but again, with these doses, are they, um, uh, if we have lower doses, okay, 40 millijoules is what's recommended for catchment, will the UV damage the, um, uh, the, uh, the DNA of the larva enough so that it can't develop? Okay, so this is another, uh, trial that was very successful as far as we could take it. Uh, but now we need to, to go back into, into rats and see what's going on in terms of can it reproduce. Okay, we're working with Dr. Ray Goodrich, uh, who's head of infectious disease in Colorado, and also Dr. Matt Platts, who's here in chemistry, uh, because they, they've used riboflavin combination with UV light uh, to reduce pathogens. And they've shown that with E. coli, it's, it's really quite effective, okay? So this photochemistry reaction, the riboflavin appears to modify the nucleic acid on, upon exposure to UV, okay? So, and then we know that the riboflavin, it's vitamin B2, you know? So it's non-toxic, non-mutagenic. So they developed um, this uh, Mirasol uh, uh, reduction system. Uh, that they can use for uh, reducing the pathogen load in blood. And this is, uh, this is, uh, has been on the market now for, I don't know, at least a decade or more. Um, so they use a riboflavin and, and a UV light combination to sterilize blood. Okay, so we wanted to see if we could use the same uh, chemistry and, and what does it do to the rat longworm. Okay, Lisa is my lab manager and she's also a very good uh, competent researcher. And so we, we ran this a while back. Um, and so we had dead controls and then live, uh, live larva. And when you look uh, with, at the controls, uh, should not stain, uh, and they did not stain, 97% remained live after treatment. Tests of riboflavin alone without UV light 
95% uh, of them still were alive. But when we added in UV light, okay, the, the light alone uh, we, we caused 77% of them to die and riboflavin and light combined resulted in 92% of those uh, dead. And so we're in the middle of, uh, this is another uh, study that we're continuing on um, and uh, hopefully we'll have uh, firm details, uh, results uh, shortly. So this is Kay, Kay Howe. Um, she got her master's with me. She's, she's the one that uh, her son Graham uh, was severely infected um, back in 2008. And she's the one that actually uh, got me in the loop here and said, you know, I, cause once I met her and I met her son, it was just like a light bulb and a light bulb went off and I'm like, why, why is a CDC in the Department of Health, State Department of Health causing, calling this a mild self-resolving flu-like disease when in fact it can be very, very serious. And Graham, her son was uh, in a coma for nearly four months. He still has symptoms. And this was, he was infected back in 2008. So anyway, Kay, Kay and I, hooked up and we started uh, the rat lungworm working group here in Hawaii. And at one point in time, we had over 20 people involved, um, but, uh, and it's still uh, uh, still a, a, a rat a working group, but um, she uh, got her, P her master's in my lab and what she worked on was uh, water. And so what she found was that L1s, L1s are not infective to humans, but they can be active for at least 56 days outside the slug host and L3s can be active for at least 21 uh, days. And so if they're active, we're assuming that they're uh, infective. And so that's one of the, uh, also another uh, rat study that we need to do. Lisa went back and looked at catchment filters because lots of filters uh, in uh, lots of houses here in Hawaii are, are on catchment tanks. And so can the filter uh, block the, uh, the larva? Uh, not completely. This one was the best, this carbon block, five micron carbon block, which has these ends on it. So it's a tighter fit. Um, so we have to be careful about what kind of uh, water treatment is, uh, is, is being used, especially when most people here in East Hawaii are on water catchment. We're also looking at diagnostics. And so um, back in 2015, we collected 435 people, stamp blood samples from the Puna Community Medical Center and clinical labs here in East Hawaii and developing a, a, a blood-based um, test. And I'm gonna speed up a little bit. I see we're running out of time. Um, so our, uh, we also isolated this, this blood-based test was developed by TIP, uh, Dr. Tip Iosimbana in, uh, Thailand. And so our first trial, we worked with her antigen uh, from Thailand, and then we decided to isolate the 31 kilodalton protein here in Hawaii. And so we ran a three-way test uh, comparison, looking at crude antigen from worms, uh, the 31 kilodalton from uh, Thailand, and our 31 kilodalton that we isolated here. And we're getting some pretty, pretty good, um, uh, good results. Uh, this is a total over here. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, uh, but where uh, I think we have, and this is published now, so I think we do have uh, uh, the makings of a blood-based antibody test here in, in Hawaii. One thing I do want to mention here is that people that said they never had symptoms, we're still seeing uh, positives uh, come up. So we're wondering if those are um, in all three tests. So are, are those uh, people that were infected uh, but never developed symptoms, um, and if if so, uh, we we want to keep keep track of that. Um, okay, uh, another diagnostic we're working on is recombinase polymerase assay (RPA), and we're doing this because PCR is the main test that's being used. But as you know, it's you need to have technical training, and you need to have thermocycler, which can be expensive. And RPA is a type of of room temperature amplification that you can actually use your body temperature and get the reaction uh, going. So this is uh, Elizabeth, she's actually my daughter, um, and she uh, developed this RPA test. Um, and it, what you can do is attach it to a lateral flow assay. I'm not gonna go into how 
uh, this works, but kind of like a pregnancy test. <laughs> okay, two stripes, <laughs> it's a positive reaction. One stripe, the control only, it's a negative reaction. And so uh, what Lizzie has shown is that this RPA, this is a lateral flow. Uh, this is 50 plasmids, 25 plasmids, 12.5 plasmids uh, per microliter. And so for sensitivity, the qPCR, which is the gold standard, uh, was a little bit more sensitive than either just the recombinant polymerase assay or the lateral flow assay, um, but they're both still in the in the running. Um, and this is, I know you can't read this. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong screen again. I know you can't read this, these small numbers, but green means the three techniques agreed with each other. Red means that they didn't agree with each other and blue is where we couldn't really tell. So we had 65.7% agreement between qPCR, RPO, XO, which is just common polymerase detected by fluorescence and RPA lateral flow assay detected um, with uh, a lateral flow assay um, uh, cartridge. So uh, this is uh, something we're uh, continuing to work on. Uh, we're just getting this work published. Uh, we do PCR to detect parasite DNA in the blood for veterinarians. Um, we, de we, developed, we published a, a study back in 2015 that shows you can detect it in peripheral blood at certain time, uh, time points. And so we detect a parasite in the whole blood of, of two out of 10 live horses. Um, we detected uh, DNA in the necropsy of a ho wild horse. We have a, a herd of wild horses in White Peel Valley that uh, 13 of them uh, became ill and we tested one of them. We only had samples from one and that was clearly positive. We can detect uh, DNA in blood of 14 of 71 live dogs that we've received from veterinarians. Uh, nothing in cats, one rabbit and, and, and the goat, one, one goat came up negative. Um, I'm just going to get really, go through this really quickly. Uh, John in my lab has been working on uh, anti-parasitic drugs, anthelmintics. And instead of going through all this, I'm going to cut to the chase here. Albendazole sulfoxide is one anti-parasitic drug that appears very uh, success, uh, effective against the larva. And it crosses the blood-brain barrier. And this is one of the main drugs that uh, clinicians currently um, uh, uh, prescribe. One other drug, pyrental citrate, uh, no, sorry, pyrental pamoate, Okay, this is pinworm medicine. And pinworm medicine is used globally since like 1970s uh, for control of pinworms all over the world in children. And we found that it's effective. And so now Hilo Medical Center, I don't know if this will work, Hilo Medical Center here, which is a main hospital in, um, oh, I don't think it's gonna, it's gonna work. Can you guys see that? So this is Dr. John Martell one of the main uh, uh, physicians, and he is now recommending the use of pinworm medicine. So if people uh, think they ate a slug, um, you know, this is, this is the over-the-counter way to go uh, that they're recommending now. So albendazole, ivermectin, moxidectin are uh, up here uh, uh, effective, uh, and they're recommended for post-exposure. Pyrantel, Pamoate as a post-exposure prophylactic. Okay, so these look like promising drugs for treatment. Last but not least, Kay has been working on the education side and she still is. We've developed booklets. This is a, a, an activity book for second grade. Um, a, well, actually kindergarten to third grade, uh, the mystery of rat lungworm disease. If anybody wants one, I'll be happy to send it out. And she's developed a citizen science um, a, a curriculum actually uh, that can be found online. Uh, so this, this is important because if the kids uh, learn in school that uh, about rat lungworm, they'll go home and, 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 and talk to their ohana and spread, uh, spread the word. Because education and um, knowing about this disease is, is half the battle. Okay, so what we recommend, inspect and wash all produce. There's a video here if you wanted to take a look. Uh, don't handle flatworms or, and don't handle slugs or snails with your bare hands, even though there's no evidence in humans that it can be transmitted across the skin. It has been shown in mice. Um, put hoses on your no uh, nozzles on your hoses to keep the slugs out. Uh, rats and slugs love dog food. <laughs> so it's like a nice dinner for them and they'll 
uh, come and uh, if you have your dog food outside, they'll come and eat the food and, and um, transmission, increased transmission. Okay, catchment tanks should be uh, maintained. Um, and of course, a lot of children like to put uh, slugs and things in their mouth. Okay, so the, we've had several instances where, where kids have picked up slugs or snails. And of course, controlling rat slugs is, is, is very important. Uh, I just like to say thank you for all of those that have been working with us and helping us. And now we are funded a line item budget in the Hawaii State Legislature, at least for a, a, the next couple of years, uh, which really, really helps. So uh, thank you very much. And are there any questions? Hi. Thank you, Sue. Um, yes. So anybody out there with questions can type them into the Q&A block um, and I will read them off. Um, well, those come in. I sort of had a broader question um, mm -hmm. about disease research uh, in 2020. It seems like a lot of attention has been focused on coronavirus and rightly so. What do you think might be some short-term or long-term impacts of pulling attention and funding away from uh, diseases that don't get quite as much attention, like rat lungworm disease? Well, you know, um, yeah, I think it's I think it's uh, coronavirus. Of course, is 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 really really important. <clears throat> um, whether it pulls money away from rat lungworm research, I haven't seen that because. I haven't been able to get funding ever from NIH, you know, up in NSF. Um, most of the funding I've had prior to getting the state funds um, uh, is, is through local uh, like uh, community foundations, local, local sources of relatively small uh, funding. And so this is the, I think the third year of uh, state funding, which our politicians, especially those on, in, uh, on Hawaii Island, uh, pushed uh, tremendously for, and so until they tell me otherwise, um, you know, I was told that uh, the funding will be uh, maintained. This year, we took a 10% hit because um, uh, Hawaii State and State of Hawaii budget has been devastated by by COVID and the lack of tourism. So whether that'll come back or not, uh, but still, um, uh, the state funding is is adequate for what we need to do right now. Cool, so uh, one of our questions from one of our faculty members here at OSU, Tal Levy, uh, is it easy to develop the lateral flow assay pregnancy test to detect DNA <laughs> after RPA? Uh, how does that work? <laughs> um, it is actually uh, fairly easy. And um, that's because the company does it. <laughs> what you have to do is, okay. So there's, there's a, this has changed over the years. Uh, but but basically you design it so that your probe has uh, uh, fam and biotin. So the, the product it, it's all it's all in the it's all in the uh, design. And if if you're interested, I'll be happy to send you the papers uh, that we used to develop this. Okay. So what you're looking at is uh, the black lines here are carbon. So it's visualized uh, by um, uh, by a carbon-based molecule, so it looks black. You can also do this, uh, use the gold uh, to uh, visualize it, um, and those tests would look red. Um, so, so it's a, a, a matter of uh, what you have. So this is this test, ours, I don't think ours is exactly like this, but it's a mobilized antibody against biotin. And so when the product is produced, you have biotin added to it, okay? And so it'll bind the product. Uh, and then you have uh, FAM. And then the, in this case, the gold will bind the, the FAM. Mm -hmm. And so you have it being immobilized by biotin and visualized by uh, a FAM and, and, uh, and uh, in this case, gold, but it can be also carbon. So lots of different mod modifications or setups of, of this particular lateral flow test. Uh, but but we we design the the probe and the primers, and then the company does the rest. You know, so you buy you buy these um, uh, cartridges which are prepared 
by uh, we buy it through Abington Health in the UK. Uh, which, you know, if you're interested, I'll be happy to provide you with information on how more detailed information on how we're setting up. And this is what we did originally. Now it's set up a little bit different. It's an anti-FAM antibody, I think, on the on the uh, catching the FAM. It's a little bit different, but same concept. You use a, a capture antibody for your product, and then you use a visualization, uh, which is all tied around the design of the of the probe of, of the amplification product, which are mm -hmm. uh, the primers in the probe. Does that answer your question? Well, yep, yes. <laughs> okay. So uh, next up is uh, Scott Mitchell wants to know: Is there any evidence to suggest that rat lungworm disease is having an impact on the existing native snail populations in Hawaii? Not that we know of. Um, so, not that not that we know of. You know, so we have lost a lot of native snail species in Hawaii, uh, but that was kind of before rat lungworm was even a real big issue. Um, or, it, I mean, it's been it been here in the islands for a long period of time. But I don't have any evidence. I haven't seen any evidence that the the, the infection actually harms the slug. Now with the rats, you know, um, you know, well, again, just looking at the evidence, if larva, and some of these slugs can have tens of thousands of larva in a single slug, and that doesn't seem to hurt them. We wish it did, <laughs> not, the, not the native ones, but all the introduced, most of the slugs and snails we're dealing with are introduced. Um, though we still have uh, a small percentage of, of native ones. But rats, on the other hand, um, we know that uh, the, the greatest number of adult worms we found in all of our studies in a single rat was 57. We pulled 57 adult uh, worms out of the pulmonary artery of a rat. That's a lot. <laughs> and I've heard in the literature, <clears throat> there is a set, set amount before the rat will die. Uh, or, um, it, I, I meant to look that up, but um, I, I would imagine it's probably closer to 100, but I'm not, I'm not sure right off the top of my head. But we, the rats that we have infected, 50 uh, adult larva, 57 larva in, in a rat pulmonary artery. That's a lot. And they, and they survived. All right, well, we are uh, just about out of time. Um, so I'd like to thank you, uh, but before that, um, see if I can share my screen for advertising next week. Um, so next week we will be having Aaron Mordecai from uh, Stanford University talking about global change and the ecology of vector-borne disease. So same time, same Zoom place. Um, but with that, uh, thank you very much, uh, Susan. We're, we're happy to host you this week and um, learn about this disease and not talk about it during lunch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good thing. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Yep. yep. Nicely done. Yep. Appreciate it. Matt, Matt looks like he's always in a dungeon someplace. <laughs>